In this session, um, which is the last of the panel sessions of the, the, the conference, um, we are looking at how we address the issue of quality of place and asking ourselves the question about how collaboration is used in that respect. What tools and ways of working help us to achieve this? How do we collaborate with developers and communities to improve the quality of place, keeping in mind what Paul has just said about some of the challenges of the context within which we're, we're working? Now, most of our panellists shared a platform a few months ago um, when I held a workshop to reflect on the, the work of the Edinburgh Urban Design Panel after its first 10 years of operation. Um, and that workshop provoked a lot of ideas that we're still working our way through. Um, so I'm hoping that this morning we're going to provoke the same sort of ideas within your minds uh, and that after the coffee break uh, we can have a discussion about that and particularly again approaching the question is there something in this for hops uh, to take uh, a leadership role a coordinating role within so i invite the panelists in the order in which they're sitting uh, sandy first of all um, to give us their thoughts on this theme sandy thank you good morning um Five minutes, which is great because um, most of what I'm going to say is a far less sophisticated way of saying what Paul said. And I think that that is because collaboration um, in placemaking is about embracing complexity. Uh, that's, that requires you to, to have some courage, actually, because it's about giving up control a lot of the time, doing things which are outside your normal uh, area of expertise. Um, it is obviously about focusing on the outcomes um, and the real outcomes, and that's where the complexity comes in, about understanding what the impact will be. And then finally, it's about, again, that, the relationships and making sure that you're having these conversations with the right people at the right time. Um, and we do think about placemaking sometimes with a, a slightly rose-tinted spectacles view, um, which will often be around um, nice places to live and to grow up, etc., um, and sometimes this can be compartmentalised. It's about a type of development which is not impossible to deliver very often, a European sort of um, aesthetic as well. But obviously, place is far more complex than that. When we get the decisions wrong about it, um, we have big consequences, big social issues. The decisions that planning makes creates that armature in which our lives must take place. It, it, it can restrict or it can liberate um, what people's aspirations are. And if you live in certain communities, then where your aspirations are, how you operate, will be functioning at a different level from, from other, uh, other communities. Decisions about how we deal with things like retail, inevitably when you speak to communities about what's important to them, they'll say the town centre, but they don't use it because it's not convenient anymore. It doesn't offer what, they, uh, what they're looking for. And there's sometimes a lack of um, imagination about how to link what a central community resource is with what people can do and what they would want to do in the future, reimagining that. So the National Performance Framework is an attempt to bring these things together to make sure that there's a purpose at the centre of things which is focused on the quality of life that people have. Um, economic growth is part of that, um, but it is about understanding what day-to-day -day life is for people. Breaking that down into individual elements, some of which will be concerned with the physical environment, some which will be uh, much more socially um, oriented, a lot of it around public health as well. And we all, I think, feel that momentum which is around public health at the moment and planning in place. Um, and so that brings me on to the place principle, obviously, which was adopted by the Scottish Government in COSLA, um, which is about collaboration. It can be seen as applehood and, uh, motherhood and apple pie. But um, it's about making sense of it. Everybody knows that um, what's in the place principle is, uh, is worthy. Um, and that we do need to think about what assets we've got, what communities uh, value within their local areas, what they will then want to maintain, what's, what's of true sustainable potential for communities, which goes beyond um, the economic and the uh, environmental often too. And so public health uh, is a big driver for what we've been doing in our team as well for, for some time now. Um, and the Scotland's public health priorities were published last year. Number one within that is that Scotland, uh, in Scotland we live in a vibrant, healthy and safe places um, and communities uh, support public health um, through the, the potential for place 
to help make that armature in which we live um, more uh, conducive to, to walking, to cycling, but also to create these important social structures which have been shown to, to be really the bedrock of, of what good public health is around. So we work closely with colleagues in public health um, on this agenda, um, and to their credit, they have embraced that complexity. Um, so when we talk about public health, we're not necessarily talking about walking and cycling all the time. We're talking about climate change, we're talking about how the environment influences people, we're talking about children's rights, we're talking um, about uh, things like youth justice, etc. too. Um, and embracing that complexity is difficult to do because you start to think to yourself, how will I possibly be able to bring my expertise into this arena in a way which is relevant and becomes frightening? But that collaboration is not about having support, it's about genuinely coming together and focusing on shared objectives, shared outcomes. Um, and you bring a certain set of values with you, but there's a certain amount of risk with that as well. But ultimately, if you're going to focus on the outcomes, you need to give up that sort of um, authority. Um, one way of doing this, and it is just one way, is through uh, the play standard and techniques like that. Fundamentally, this is about um, creating, trying to create these structured conversations which are meaningful, and trying to link up the conversations which take place in communities, with development planning, with decisions which are made with community planning, um, and with decisions across local authority structures too. Um, it deals with sustainability in the widest sense as well, and it is about what's of value to communities. So when we talk about participative democracy, it's not just about the fact that that is the right thing to do to involve people in decisions in the local area, it's that it's the right thing to do because it's a smart thing to do, because they have intelligence about uh, the local area, about what will be likely to be embraced, sustained, about the modes uh, of, of behaviour within that particular area. And I was just to finish on, on this, um, this image, which for me kind of sums a lot of it up, is that somebody can have the lead in something, but the power often lies somewhere else. And it is then about, having, about mediating that relationship and making sure that you're both, you have these shared values, that the final destination is somewhere where you want to get to together. Um, and that, for me, is about, that's at the heart of developing a collaborative relationship for placemaking, but for place-based working generally, which obviously straddles um, many more areas in, in planning. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Heather Chappell, I'm from Architecture and Design Scotland. I feel really um, like the imposter in here, I'm an architect, I'm not a planner. For those of you who don't know Architecture and Design Scotland, we're a key agency, but we're the little tiny one, we're 25 folk, with the whole of Scotland and anything in the built environment to deal with. So we don't have any power, we don't have any authority. So I'm going to talk to you today about, the, I suppose, the two hours in our history, about 10 years ago, that changed the way that we work and it seems to be quite relevant to the discussions and the decisions that you guys are going through at the moment. So, I've not brought any nice pictures. I've brought a couple of diagrams. I think in order to understand how we make change, we have to understand the nature of the system that we're working in. So, this is all about change theory. C and E is cause and effect. And can you still hear me if I talk over here? I tend to have quite a big voice. Um, this sort of system here is like manufacturing. This is um, where you refine the process and it's the link between what you put in and what you come out is totally predictable. It's nice and easy. None of us work in that world. Complicated. Now this is the world of the professional. This is where we set policies, we understand processes, and if you put something in one end, it goes through and provided you do everything right, you get something out at the end that, you know, it'll be slightly different in different cases, but the qualities are, should be about predictable. And we use our professional skills to analyse and say, yes, that's a good response, or no, it's not. The types of sticky, um, wicked problems that Leslie was talking about yesterday, the types of um, things that Paul was talking about this morning, they don't fit into that world. We can't map everything that's in there. We can't control it, and, but if we ever did manage to map it, it would all change again. The issues we're talking about solving here now in the complex area. Cause and effect is linked, but you don't often know about that until afterwards. You know, it's only after something's happened, you go, oh yeah, that's probably linked to that action that we did over here. 
but you can't tell. And the way to operate in that system is to probe, you know, give a little push, listen, see if you're getting the right sort of response. If you are, do more. If you're not, you know, if you hit a hot spot, run away and try something different. So it's very much about being agile. It's very much about being open. And it's probably less about the types of things that give us all the comfort that we used to. So, as I said, about, about 10 years ago, we had a, two hours where we decided we needed to go from complicated, where we would set out our stall and tell everybody what we wanted to see and then tell them that they hadn't done it, into the complex where we just have to put all of those uh, comfort blankets aside. So, um, this is about a bit of long-term thinking. This particular instance, no names, no pack drill. I don't know if anybody from the area is here. We were asked in by a local authority to have a look at a building that was getting put in the centre of their, one of their towns. There was a public sector development, the type of thing that you just can't say no to. The councillors were going to approve whatever came forward because it was really needed public facility. Nobody was going to say no to this. And the client for this facility, bullish sort of a chap. He was, he was not in an interest in listening, not in planning terms, not in urban design terms. He had a budget, he had a deadline, he had a service, and he was going for it. But there's a council officer, the um, planning officer going, I'm not really sure about this, this is all a bit scary. So we, you know, geared up and we got our best guys and we were all in the room together and we just thought, this is a car crash. This is never going to work. We can link to policy, we can link to good design advice, we can do all these things, he's not going to listen at all. So instead of coming with our baggage, with our interests, what we did, we sat there for two hours and we helped him test how this would work for him. So for the people that were using the service, for the staff that were working there, and just took him through and he had this penny drop moment. It wasn't working for him at all, it was rubbish. He couldn't work out how he got that far, but it's because most of the people around it, they really weren't understanding what the drawings were telling them. In the same way, a lot of your members probably don't understand all of the drawings in front of them sometimes. So, at the end of it, we said, OK, what can we do? So, write us a report telling us we're rubbish to, you know, we're just mad to do that. And he a brave soul. He took it up to his board and he got a little bit more time and he got a little bit more money to bring some skills in. And he sorted out some of the worst things that are in there. I still can't go past that building without being shocked about what it could have been, but it was much, much better. But out of that two hours, what we got was an advocate to change the way that body ran their investment programme, because they realised they didn't have the skills on board internally, and they were concentrating on getting from A to B, but not how useful B was at the end. So in this thing here, this sort of diagram, if we were operating on our old way, we were looking at that first project in the system, we'd have told them all the things that were wrong in the white bit. This is bad, the other's bad, you need to sort it out. We helped them understand that, but actually what we did was we held up the benefits of the change that he'd managed to achieve. We gave him some room and some help in his authority to start to make it better. And actually the next project wasn't just a little bit better, it was brilliantly better. It was one when I opened the, um, I opened the drawings, I was expecting, oh no, it's this guy. It's that design team. It's going to be. And it was lovely. We helped them get the skills to take it on the next level. So that's now how we work. We don't set out, this is what we want to see. We don't set out a particular process. What we try to do is in a locality with the people involved, what the heck's the problem here? What is it we're trying to solve? We might use the play standard or some other tool to do that. But can we then get that in a way that we all understand? Can we say what needs to be different in straightforward human terms? So, you know, I, I need to be able to get to school without, my, you know, without um, the kids breathing in too many fumes. I need to be able to. Can we describe those in straightforward human terms what we're after? Not presume a solution, not write down a, a full guide, but are there some places that for that community provide that type of feel, that type of aspect? And this comes back to some of the discussion Paul was having about the gentrification, when we've worked with um, ex-mining communities to go, 
those sorts of places use design professionals like, they don't feel like they're for the likes of us. We have to find different sort of models that are, you know, equally interesting, equally valuable, but maybe a bit more gutsy, a bit more funky, but something that actually feels comfortable for them rather than off-putting. And then capture that in a way that we can all use as a basis. So we can say, if it does this, are we all happy? And use that as the basis going through. And then at the end, did it work? And feed that back in. So it's not a, it, there's not a policy in there, but there's a process by which we all come together. But we do have to take that time to put your own baggage to one side and to step into what are you trying to achieve? And then use the skills that we have as professionals to help them get there rather than to describe that ourselves. So that's me. Next one. Hello, um, I'm Emma. Um, I'm a design officer at Glasgow City Council. It's my job to convince planners, developers um, that come into the office that design is a good thing. Design is about people and it's about people's well-being. So it's a tough gig. <laughs> Um, I've been asked to talk about today um, how collaboration delivers good development. First and foremost, I think it is a good planning process and pre-application process, so talking about the bins. <laughs> um, but today the focus of my talk is about the Glasgow Urban Design Panel. The Glasgow Urban Design Panel is a forum that enables an unbiased conversation on design, city policy, public and private um, projects. Its value is in its position to independently peer review projects and make recommendations to the city. It draws on the amazing range of talent that we have in the city to include building environment experts, um, professional organisations, amenity and local interest groups. The Glasgow Institute of Architects volunteer as the lead of the Secretariat and together with the Glasgow Civic Forum, invite building experts to review projects and report on the panel findings. Glasgow City Council City Design hosts the panel in the city chambers and facilitate the panel by chairing and proposing projects for review. And we are responsible for encouraging the panel recommendations to be considered within the pre-application process. The role of the panel is to champion quality design and placemaking for the city. This is central to the conversations in every design review that we hold, and it's stated in the panel mission statement, which is here. Um, this is the typical makeup of the panel. Um, we've got a huge amount of people that sit around the table. That includes RTPI, the Landscape Institute, um, Historic and Environment Scotland. It includes the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow School of Art, the GIA, who are the panel reporters and the, the vice chair, ourselves, Rafa Esposito, I don't know if you know him, um, he's a city design officer as well. He's the panel chair, there's me, <laughs> the panel manager, um, the case officer for the project that we're presenting, and we also have guest panelists as well and panel observers. So, and amenity groups, don't let me forget amenity groups, we've got you know, lots of people from the community there as well. So um, what we've done is we've been working in collaboration with the core governance team, which is the GIE and the Glasgow Civic Forum, and we've established new design review guidance. The booklet intimates what we do, how we do it, it advocates the process and conveys our core values. Um, and it's available on the GIE website if you're interested in the details. So the GIE, or sorry, the GUDP as a platform for collaboration um, the way the panel is set up positions the planning department and the design officers as enablers and facilitators of conversations around about architecture, design and placemaking. It also enables us to have a broad view of projects coming through the planning process across the city and with that comes the opportunity to identify projects and policies that would benefit from discussion and knowledge sharing. At the end of last year, um, we facilitated a panel to discuss three projects within the waterway area um, of Govan, adjacent to the Old Heartland and Wolf Docks. We started the session with a quick update on the strategic development framework on the river, 
um, and presented the Water Row Housing Master Plan, um, which has been, it's been quite a, a great process. And the master plan and the design framework was created in conjunction with um, local community groups. This set the scene for design reviews on the refurbishment of works of Govan Old Parish Church. Um, I don't know if you know anything about it, but that's one of the early settlement areas in Glasgow, and it's where the Hogback Stones are exhibited. And we also use this as a design review for the new pedestrian link bridge from Water Row landing in front of the Transport Museum, connecting um, the com communities of Govan and Partick. Um, it was quite an exciting forum because we had guest panellists including the project architect on the Riverside Museum from Zaha Hadid. Um, we also had the engineer, you'll know in Edinburgh from the Queensferry Bridge Crossing. Um, it was a fantastic panel session and everybody from all the projects remained there for the whole of the session. So it was a, a great collaborative process and what happened through that process is actually everybody got to understand what was going on because things take quite a long time sometimes to go through the planning process and these projects hadn't yet had, had consent so they weren't in the public eye. So after that, we thought that the panel could also provide a platform to translate the panel's independent voice into pragmatic policy and strategies, as well as opening a conversation on designing better places, neighbourhoods and enhancing communities. Earlier this year, we cons consulted on the River SDF, or the consultation on the River SDF was launched, and we were keen to review this in tandem with a key city centre project that was fronting onto the river. The panel were invited to comment and the panel were delighted to be involved and to give some com um, comments back on such an influential document. To be honest, we weren't quite sure how successful the panel session would be, um, but the feedback from both the panel and forward planning was really positive and we intended to review more of the SDFs coming forward. Um, one of the key priorities of the River SDF is to bring more people and activity onto the river. A key component of this is the Scottish Exhibition Centre expansion. The session on the SDF enabled the panel members to focus on issues raised by the River SDF and informed a better conversation on the Scottish Exhibition Centre, a project of national significance. The panel noted that the red line boundary appeared to limit the potential of the project and that the enhancement of the complex has the potential to have a greater impact on the river and on the city. Um, and me saying this is a wonderful process is, is all very great standing here, but it's great to have feedback from the guest panel members. Um, so this is a, a comment or a, some feedback from Professor Gordon Murray. It wasn't the first and it hasn't been the last, but it's essential that the city keep reflecting on the art of the possible. It was obviously no accident that both the items on the agenda were so symbiotic, <coughs> yet many of the questions raised by the first could be intel through intelligent use of resources be answered by the second. Indeed, good or bad, it is impossible that the decisions made on the SE SEC will not influence the nature of change on the river for decades to come. As I quoted, we are most often influenced by those with whom we have least in common. A most enjoyable morning. Keep up the good work. One of my favourite quotes is, don't judge every day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you sow. This is true of the panel. Through the art of collaboration, I hope that the panel continues to flourish and improve the quality of design in, in Glasgow. Thank you very much for listening. Good morning everyone, my name is Ashley Mullen, um, I'm the Place and Design Officer at Western Bartonshire Council. Um, I was employed to set up and manage the, uh, an urban design forum um, and I'm going to talk to you today about the, what our panel has encouraged in terms of good design and also the greater collaboration amongst our Western Bartonshire colleagues in different departments. The Scottish Government's document, Creating Places, outlines that physical and social environments are critical elements in people's lives and have an impact on their health and well-being. We know that architects and planners, urban designers and landscape architects are trained to recognise and reflect this in the way that they design and work. Unfortunately, 
When, things, when there are savings to be made in a project, it's usually the design that is seen as a frilly extra and that can be cut from project. In Western Bartonshire, we're using a number of interventions in the planning process to send the message that we're about good design. That placemaking and the quality of design standard expected in Western Bartonshire, particularly on our key waterfront sites, must be high in the agenda if we are to improve the socio-economic forecast there. To achieve this, the Council have increased awareness of a robust pre-application process and has also invested in the creation of the Place and Design Panel. The Western Bartonshire Place and Design Panel is one of the newest design review panels in Scotland and all of the others exist in cities or affluent areas. It was set up in support, with the support of the Scottish Government, Architecture and Design Scotland, the Improvement Service and both Glasgow and Strathclyde Universities and Homes for Scotland. And the work we're doing with the panel is reckon, has been recognised on a, a national level with a recent visit from the Minister, Kevin Stewart. The panel will sit monthly and is supported by more than 70 volunteers from the skills of architecture, landscape architecture, planning and urban design. We also offer special, specialist skills on the panel, such as inclusivity experts, ecologists, heritage and conservation experts. And we essentially tailor every panel to the project the type of project it is reviewing, um, always asking ourselves, how can we add value to this project? Reviewing the project, the panellists offer their special knowledge and skills as designers in a workshop environment. The themes that emerge from the panel sitting are expected to be taken forward by the design team in the, way, the same way that the planning issues highlighted by the planning officers are expected to be taken forward in the evolution of the design we have written this into our LDP, which gives the process the weight it requires for it to be taken seriously by developers, and the reports from the panel become a material consideration in the planning process. Western Bartonshire hasn't always felt in a strong position to make developers work harder to create better places. Although we know it to be true, it's difficult to demonstrate that better places can result in better outcomes in terms of social economic impact and an impact on the health and well-being of our communities. A developer's promise of several jobs coming to an area as a result of an investment and the perception that if we challenge a developer on the point of design principle, they might walk away and that those jobs won't be delivered. That has shaped often the outcome of, our, of many planning decisions. Predicated on the decline of industry in Western Bartonshire and the low aspirations of the people there, we have taken what we can get, development sometimes for the sake of development irrespective of the quality of the contribution to the overall place that development offers. The Place and Design Panel assists with changing this attitude, empowering a demand for better consideration of design on a development. The focus on Place and Design for the panel is important. In an area of multiple levels of deprivation and significantly poor health and well-being, it is as much about raising the aspirations of the people there as it is about encouraging development and growth. We all know that this can be achieved by insisting that the buildings and the spaces between are well considered and conceived with due consideration to urban design. The Place and Design Panel is to identify weak and inappropriate development at an early stage. It's supposed to save time and money later in the application process by supporting and giving confidence to, and consistency to decision makers. It has a key role, core ethos to support this, um, and that is in providing objective, professional advice to designers to drive high quality design, to be an enabler and not an obstacle maker, and to work collaboratively with developers, architects and contractors with the aim of seeing that the development contributes to a culture of quality and a high standard of design excellence, resulting in a built environment that raises aspirations, elevates levels of health and wellbeing and increases economic vitality. The panel has been operation, in operation now for just over a year and in 14 settings we have reviewed 18 projects, varying in nature, stage of development and complexity, including projects in our key regeneration sites such as Dumbarton Water, a Waterfront and Queen's Quay. We have looked at vacant sites requiring development and smaller sites in which the development would contribute to the overall quality of the place. We've also reviewed policy documents, conservation area proposals and design standards for our housing projects. The work of the panel and the work as Place and Design Officer has had a much wider impact than first anticipated. Very close working relationships have emerged between the panel and planning officers and perhaps more importantly, closer working relationships have been fostered between different council departments. 
There has also been a marked increase in awareness within council teams and external project delivery partners of what it takes to create great places with longevity and resilience where people can thrive and the mistakes of the past are to be avoided. We are working closely with our regeneration colleagues, consultancy services colleagues, asset management and roads colleagues, and are working with education right now to identify if there's a need for a school on Queen's Quay, which would be a must if this is to be a truly walkable community. The increased collaboration with wider council services has led to heightened awareness of the benefits that early engagement with planning can bring to our development. Developers are realising that we are about good design. A planning and HSCP working group has been begun to convene regularly and we are working to incorporate the knowledge of our NHS colleagues into the panel process to drive forward the ambition to improve health and well-being through development. We have seen real results in the change in the quality of the proposals that have come forward after the panel process, including better quality landscapes and sud solutions, more consideration of pedestrian movement in and through sites and how sign sites relate to important routes or transport linkages. There's been development of more inclusive designs in our affordable homes and in our streets and external spaces. Better consideration of materials in terms of sustainability, robustness and longevity and less car-centric development. Our strategic lead has even been heard to say um, that we are, not a, we are not in the business of just delivering houses, we are about delivering homes and communities, which is quite refreshing for us. Western Bartonshire Council are now, now feel that we are getting to a position where there, it feels less and less daunting to ask for better designs from developers, where the desire for growth does not surpass the desire for good urban design. Thank you. My name is Susan Horner, I'm a design officer with the City of Edinburgh Council and I'm here to talk about the Edinburgh Urban Design Panel. The Edinburgh Urban Design Panel was set up by Planning Committee. The panel first met in March 2009 and has reviewed almost 200 development proposals over the past 10 years. The aim of the panel is to raise the quality of the built environment within the city by providing constructive design advice at an early stage in the preparation of development proposals, to impart advice on relevant council policy and guidance, and to provide a focus for projects significant in the city. Planning Committee established the panel as an independent source of advice but wanted the process to be embedded within the development management process in order to have greatest impact. For that reason, the panel's meeting have always been chaired by a senior planning service manager acting in a facilitating role and serviced by planning officers with design skills. Also, there is a requirement for an annual review of effectiveness an annual review of effectiveness is reported to the planning committee. So, panel members. The panel is made up of voluntary representatives from a range of member organisations agreed by planning committee. The wide range of skills and experience of the panel members brings significant benefit in terms of the insight that can be offered on major and complex projects where a range of design issues will be raised. The discussion at panel meetings benefit from cross-disciplinary contributions and can often result in design teams reconsidering aspects of their proposals in a broader context. Annual review. As stated earlier, there is a requirement that an annual review of effectiveness is reported to the planning committee. This is a key component of the panel. The review typically considers feedback, work programme, organisation of the panel, case studies, and concludes with recommendations and actions. Last year, it was agreed to mark 10 years of the panel's operation with a workshop which was held in March. The focus of the workshop was lessons learned from the panel's work over the 10 years 
and the output is being used to inform this year's review. Planning Committee Tour. The Planning Committee Tour looks at recently completed development within the city. The Edinburgh panel members attend the tour, which provides an opportunity for discussion. And finally, these are just some images of completed developments that have been seen by the panel. 21st century housing at Gracemount, the Arches Market Street, and finally, Sugar House Close. Thank you.